Um, I think that prep time is, is where debates are lost. Uh, I think it's where most people can make the biggest improvement. Um, and it's also something I don't think training uh, at any institution or training member team focus on enough. And something judges aren't very good at giving you feedback on. Um, uh, and so I think that's something that everyone can work on. I'm going to talk about how I prep. Um, and what I would say is I wouldn't aim to like copy this outright because everyone constructs ideas and arguments in a different way in their brain. Everyone has a, a unique way of um, sort of visualising concepts in their mind. So it wouldn't make sense to you to do it quite as I do. But I mean, if you if you want to get serious about getting very good at debating or getting good, something you need to do is to sit down and think: What do I want to get out of prep time? And then what processes are going to allow me to do that? So the first question you've got to ask is what you want to get out. I think there are roughly, we use different colours for them as we track their progress throughout prep time, two different things that we want to be in the debate if we're going to do well. So the first thing we'll do is on this side is we want to be developed. What we mean by wanting to be relevant is by the end of prep time we want to know exactly or as close as possible what the difference between the two sides are and what they're arguing is and what the context, what contextual information is in this debate which other teams might bring up or which we might use to further our arguments. So this is about um, two different things then. It's partly about um, working out what the comparative is. Comparative is a word everyone talks about a lot in debating but I don't think anyone ever quite takes time to explain what it means. What the comparative means is, is what the, the differences between the two sides, what they're arguing for, is. And therefore, that's what you should base your argument on. Um, to give an example, the motion I'll be talking about most of the time, because we did it last Wednesday in training, so I think it'll work, is about whether or not it is legitimate to assassinate political leaders, I mean, presumably in war. Um, and the comparative in that is whether or not it is legitimate, not whether or not these things happen, or even necessarily whether or not they are good or bad, but whether or not they're legitimate. And focusing on that thing, which is where the comparative is, not the other ones, is very important. And the second thing about being relevant is knowledge. Right? Uh, and at the end of the day, this is just going to mean you're just going to have to know stuff if you want to get good at You already know a lot more about the world and current affairs than you think you do. And if you have the right ways of triggering your brain, triggering your mind in prep time, you'll be able to unearth more examples and things than you thought you know. But like knowing stuff about the world knowledge is, uh, is important um, if you're going to be persuasive. Being able to name drop political leaders, being able to name drop or whatever else, right? Um, when the motion came up last week uh, about uh, political assassinations, um, in my mind, I was, I was thinking of what are the theatres of, of conflict where we might have chosen to use this in recent memory. I think they're Libya, uh, Syria, um, the Yugoslav wars potentially, not Afghanistan, I don't think. Um, uh, and then also places where other things are going, like the ongoing uh, conflict in um, uh, DRC would be an example of somewhere this might happen, um, or, or whatever else, like ongoing conflicts potentially in, in Mexico. Um, or uh, in, in Colombia would again be examples of places where we might want to kill leaders above other things. But you just need to be good at triggering those things. So that's the first thing you need to establish in the prep time, and that's the tools to make yourself relevant. So that's to be talking about the right part of the debate and to also know stuff about the world relating to that part of the debate. Second thing you need to be able to do by the end of the debate is you need to be talking about things which are, are true slash persuasive. Oh, I might miss an S out there. So the second thing you want to be doing then, once you've got an idea of where the debate is happening, is thinking what are the and the tr true word right now, what are the claims I'm making, right? Um, so I don't know, get one. What are the, the claims I'm making? Um, so having an idea of yeah, it's essentially of what things you are stating or trying to be true, what they are. And then secondly, working out how they fit together and filling in the links between them uh, and organising claims.
So, between all of these things, it's everything you need to win a debate. And if you don't have any one of these things, you're ultimately going to struggle because you're going to be talking about something which is can be generally applied to both sides if you're not talking about a comparative. You're going to seem out of your depth and come across as unpersuasive if you can't show any knowledge of the situation on the ground of what's going on. Um, if you're unaware of what claims you're trying to make are, your analysis is going to be very mixed and it's, it's never going to hit that end you want to get to. And if you aren't able to organise those claims, again, you're going to come across as uh, unstructured and your argument isn't going to flow. So those, those are the four things we're trying to establish in prep time. Does that make sense for everyone? Okay. So then, with that being the case, um, in terms of what we do in prep time then, uh, I'll grab a... Grab a um, the first thing we want to do then in prep time is we want to focus on this side. Because in order to work out what claims we want to make, we first have to know what the world we're looking at is and what thing we're trying to show is, right? So, so the argumentation cannot realistically come in until we have a, as full an understanding as we're going to have about what's going on in the debate. Um, and that means, that, and this is the, the first rule of prep time, is that we do not start just thinking about arguments, right? Because those arguments we just start thinking about, we have no reason to know necessarily that they hit the nail on the head in terms of what, where the comparative in the debate is, and we haven't thought about the knowledge which might interact with those arguments yet. So if you... But it seems like that's something everyone does at the moment, right? You go in, you're, you're given, I don't know, let's um, legalise all drugs, and you're, you're on proposition, the first thing you'll think is like, uh, freedom, or self-expression, or bodily autonomy or something, right? You, you have to wait first, right? Hold back that urge, be patient, be self-disciplined, and first establish what the situation on the ground is, right? So the first thing we do before we do the comparative is we ask ourselves, um, um, yes, yeah, so we ask ourselves, uh, where does this happen? We ask ourselves, what is happening? Uh, and we ask ourselves, who does this happen to, right? And like, other similar questions that you might have done if you've done like, if you ever did, for instance, any journalism in your English classes, you'd be asked similar questions about investigating an idea, right? So, uh, let's take um, it's legitimate to assassinate political fi figures, right? That is happening in, in uh, where it's happening in theatres of war. Uh, we'll just we'll write war for now. Um, and then if we can, we're going to give some examples of the kinds of wars we're talking about. Uh, X, Y, and Z. In terms of what is happening, we're talking about it being a tool of war used by actors we believe to engage in legitimate behaviour. So a tool of war from like the United States of America or Western states in general. We're not talking about it being a tool of war for, um, I don't know, Boko Haram or something on, because we don't believe them to have that same respect for the ideas of what is legitimate in war based off previous actions like enslaving people, um, use of child soldiers, whatever else. But, so in terms of what is happening, talking a uh, tool of war, for West, um, and then we're also looking at what the consequences of that are for the what. So here we're not trying to paint things in a positive or negative light, because that would spin the way in which we think about the truth to such an extent we might not reach it, but instead we're just trying to play out what we think the consequences of happening on the ground are, right? So we're talking about, um, like, leader gets killed, and some sort of transfer of power. And then like some like consequences from that. Right, so that, that's what so that's what's happening. That's what we think is going to happen if we kill a leader. We can show those links. We think everyone in the debate is probably going to agree that that's what happened or what's trying to happen. Though we can obviously attack those as well, and they are they have to be analytically shown. That these are things which can absolutely be thought to be true. But we've got an idea of what's going on. And then finally with who, we're sort of answered anyway, but we're talking about a tool of war for the West. And then we might, whenever we're talking about 
any group want to be as specific as possible. So we might want to say we're talking about um, CIA slash top generals. Particularly as we know, or we may well know if it's gone back to our mind, that the CIA has a history of engaging this, in this kind of behaviour even without the consent of um, its uh, leader, the president. Uh, for instance, it's engaged in behaviour in Angola before, or Guatemala, or other cases, right? You might not know those examples, but you probably are aware, in some extent, in the back of your brain, that the CIA has killed communist leaders in the developing world, or in Central America, right? If, if you haven't done that, now you do, I suppose. So we've got that idea in our mind, and now we've got a rough idea of what's going on before we do anything else. But no, we haven't yet, I mean, it doesn't even matter what side of the motion we're on here, right? We haven't made any claims about any of this stuff being good or bad in our mind. We've tried our best to avoid um, the temptation to jump into arguments. So is everyone with me so far? Yeah? Good. So it's just a vague thing to add to it. Don't quite this as long as I normally would. Afterwards, we'll try and work through a, a prep time. So we've got that there. And I think we've got a rough idea of where the comparative is as well, with it being legitimate actors. And um, we're going to circle it in, in this. Tall of War for the West is where the comparative of it being legitimate is. Right? So now we come over to our sort of claims side of the board. So the, the first question we're asking ourselves when we're looking at what claims we're making um, is, again, not going to be whether or not something is good or bad. That is not what this debate is. But the motion, but just to look at the words of the motion and see what they require us to argue. So in this case, the motion is uh, something, something, something legitimate. Right? So we know that at the end of our claims, no, at the end of our, the, the long chain of claims and examples and pieces of analysis we use, we have to be showing that something is either legitimate or illegitimate, and that is clearly distinct from good or bad, um, in a, like a utilitarian case. Right? There are actions which could be argued to be both good and illegitimate. Um, for instance, I think it's I, I would be comfortable making the claim, and I, I would be able to make the claim that the dropping of the atomic bombs are, on Japan were illegitimate actions because of the civilian death they caused. But also, I might potentially be able to make the claim that those were positive actions insofar as they ended a war early and stopped other suffering, whatever else. I don't believe they did, but that is, a, that is something which a judge could be persuaded of. And furthermore, they could be persuaded of both of those things at the same time meaning that good is not defined as legitimate, right? And there is something further. So in this case, we know that any claim we're going to have to make about these actions and the state of affairs on the ground has got to match up some definition of legitimate. So now the next question we're asking ourselves is, what does that word mean? Right? Now, when we're coming to war, um, there are essentially, or in any debate which is legitimate, there are essentially two ways to go, right? So, one way we could go, and this is where it changes whether or not we're on clock law, is we can argue um, some sort of like utile basis. That would be to say that um, we should only care about the lived experiences of real beings, and insofar as we care about rules or legitimacy or whatever else, we should only care about those and so far as they affect the lived experience of human beings, uh, or beings in general, and if that is improved, then an action would be legitimate. But a second one we can talk about is we can talk about, like, um, have like a international war crime theory or something, and talk about like rules of war as another way of looking at what's legitimate, right? So war crimes. So there are some things that we just don't do. We we never use um, sexual assault as a weapon of war even in cases where it would be to a utilely, a, a utile positive end. We never um, use cluster bombs, even though they could be effective or whatever else. So, so we, the, the first thing we're doing with our claim, working out, is 
what claim we're making on the word legitimate. And we know that's a claim we're making that we don't have to show, but we need to be aware of that, right? And then once we've picked whatever that claim is, we might be making like, multiple claims to like, cover ourselves, so say, we think that legitimacy is about, um, I don't know, damage to civilians or something, but then go, but even if it's wrong, we also make the claim that it's utile, good or bad. So you, you can make both claims simultaneously if you say one, but even if that's wrong, the other. But we need to be aware that's the first claim we're making is one of these. And then after that, it's about then following on and like literally mapping out based on the knowledge we have available to us how we are showing this, right? And, and asking ourselves why, and like almost building like a, a flowchart. So let's take that it's something is like an illegitimate if it's a war crime, um, and we'll then what we need to do is make it analogous to some other war crime, right? So we'll take this definition. So that's our first claim. But then our next claim has to be that that is that, and there's some grander claim there that this is a war crime. Uh, and now we need to think about ways in which it's similar to other war crimes, right? So other claims we might make on this is we might be because it's a uh, civilian um, infrastructure. And we'd use the example of, um, it would be like obviously wrong for us to um, like dismantle the civilian civil service of a state we're at war at. Um, like you're only allowed to attack, like attack military parts of the government. Civilian parts of the government, like a school or a hospital, is not attachable. And we can also do it on this way, which is that it will um, uh, shut down. Uh, schools and uh, hospitals, and that's equal to bombing them. So these are two different ways, two different claims we can make to show this bigger one, and different ways we can show them. So, so with this one, we're saying that when you cause anarchy, when you when you shut down a government, when you stop a government being able to function, which is what the proposition would need. At that point, the services the government provides stop to function, right? Um, and when it does that, when schools and hospitals are closed, when, it, when they can't provide education or um, sort of healthcare, that is a moral equivalent to bombing those institutions. So do you see how we've um, used, and what we're doing then is we're using some of our facts. So the kind of facts we're using are this transfer of power consequences fact is then showing um, is showing that bit, whereas this leader being killed and him being having a civilian role is showing uh, this bit. Does that make sense or not? I mean, this is how I think about debating, but I'm, I'm always worried if people think about it the same way. Yeah. I just like to contextualise it. So, that like you're giving the speech uh, and you like the, your speech is effectively the right hand board. Yeah. And like the so you think about like oh what changes and then you think about arguments yeah um, and so those are effectively just your two points there yeah those are effectively my two points mm. um, and then when I'm talking about once I've worked out what the claims I want to make I then use all the information I have over here to make those claims over there uh, true right to to provide the analysis and the examples and the analogies um, to like the name dropping leaders in conflict, so it makes it seem like I've got going on, whatever else. Like, this is almost like my toolbox, but I'm, never, I'm, never, I'm not going to stand up and like, say that. I'm going to say this, but I'm using... That, like, but like, this is essential for that to work as well as possible, so I have to do that first. So, does that make sense? And, I, and then there's, we might... Um, we won't play through any other way in which we build claims there, but that's a way for it to happen. And if you another way of making sure you've shown all the things you want is um, I uh, one of the schools I teach at or taught at now. Uh, not everybody there um, spoke. Uh, not not everybody there was able to read or write. But you know that's in a city commentary or parts of a city commentary for you, I guess, right? So you know systemic failure of the state. 
But, um, they, yeah, anyway. Um, so I asked them to write me speeches, and some of them drew flowchart diagrams. Um, for instance, there was one we did, you should support your local football team. And they, they drew, um, you go to a game, uh, and you, like, your next door neighbor goes to the game with you, and then like, you're all there, there on your street wearing like, your scarves together, and that like, community spirit has been improved. Because they didn't have the words to actually write that down, but they could express those ideas, right? And then they were able to say them speaking. And I think actually, I learned quite a lot from that myself, that it can be useful to map out, and literally map out, what's going on. Now you don't have to draw pictures, you can write the words, because hopefully all of you in this room are literate. <laughs> um, but, well, you never know. Um, I mean, I, I, my handwriting's awful. Like, whenever I pass a note to anyone on my team, I've got to write it in like, non-joined up letters, which means it takes about twice as long as it should, and also really hurts my hand. Um, but that's something I do, so, so finally I'd end up, you see how we're actually building this, I, I finally end up with a sheet I'm holding, which has got on it these blocks in this room, yeah? So, in terms of like consuming what the other side's going to say, do you build that into the bit where you're talking about the impartial changes then? Or sort um, of preemptive rebuttal or something? So, when it comes to preemptive, I would say that at the start of when I'm looking at the claims and what claims I'm going to make, I might be looking at what claims other sides might make on, and how they would fit together. Um, but because everything we're talking about, because the way we're built up is central to the debate, the other side either is saying stuff which clashes directly with my arguments and is trying to refute, refute the claims I'm making, in which case I'm building in safeguards, or they're being irrelevant and my need to rebut them is not so great. Um, people are, the biggest issue in debates is not that people's arguments are bad, it's just that they, they miss like hitting the nail on the head of, of where the debate's going on and what you need to talk about. Um, so let's let's go through a prep for a motion then, shall we? Um, what's a motion? Does anyone go to Trent? Yeah, I'll well, see some going to Trent at the weekend. Yeah, so, so a motion that anyone found difficult. Because I think that for easier motions, like it's easier to prep for, but when it matters is where it's a bit more unclear or you've, you've got a work a bit hard to get someone. So it's a motion, yeah. Yeah, sure. round, round four. So this house believes that courts in developing countries should break up uh, consistently dominant political parties. Okay. Yeah, that is quite a tough motion. I hear that about it. Um, I quite like it though. It's pretty interesting. Oh yeah, yeah, it's interesting. It's quite hard. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 it, it definitely is. Um, <laughs> yeah. So we're going to write the, the motion up on this side because lots of our claims are going to come from the words in the motion, remember. So we've got uh, this. In then. What, what was the wording? Should, like, the break up the co should break up consistently dominant political parties. Okay, so that's that's the motion we've got. That courts should, in developing countries, should break up consistently dominant political parties. Now, on this side, when we're talking about, this is quite a knowledge-heavy motion, so we're going to have to spend longer than we normally would in prep time working out what we think is going on, the kind of case we're talking about. So, when we're asking who, we've got lots of questions for who, right? So, first question we're asking ourselves is courts. In, the, in developing countries, who are they, uh, and what are they in this case? Um, and we need to ask ourselves questions like, uh, do we think they are unbiased? Um, and how do we think they fit up with other socio-economic battles taking place within a nation? Like how they like socio-economically, socio-economic stuff. 
right? So is it the case that, for instance, um, I don't know, in India, uh, where the INC was in power for over 50 years, is it the case that the courts there are going to give a fair hearing to the BJP or not? I, I, I honestly don't know. That's a question we need to ask ourselves and be thinking about. Also, when we're talking about uh, who, we've got to think about what countries we're talking about. And think of any examples we can think of of parties which have been in power for a very long time. Um, uh, and I think that the obvious examples are India and uh, South Africa. Malaysia and Singapore. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, Singapore's a great one, actually. Um, Zimbabwe. Yeah. <laughs> right? But there are lots of countries. But also, we don't, we don't want to get dragged down just talking about our own example. Right? We don't want to just be talking about South Africa. Because what if it's a case that this is like a good idea in South Africa, but a terrible place generally, terrible idea generally, then we'll lose that debate. So we're now trying to think, what are the things that is in common with the parties as well? So countries, and we'll put parties there as well. Now, I actually don't know the name of all the parties. Now, I know, I know the name of the leader in Singapore, not the name. It's a shame we just that. Um, but there we're talking about the ANC, now we're talking about the INC. Um, what, is the, what are the things which are true or not true about uh, these parties, right? Well, I mean, for these two at least, we don't know about this one, but we think it might be true. I mean, they are uh, formed uh, post-liberation. And also they're sort of broad caucuses, right? Broad, broad churches. So we're talking about parties which have played a, either themselves played a role or people who are important in the founding of them have played an important role in the um, like original years after um, sort of uh, like the institutions of colonialism was to some extent broken down to the extent that they are. So that might be obviously ANC being the party of Mandela, there might be uh, the uh, links the INC has to um, Nehru. Um, uh, and yeah, well, but the, the thing is, is uh, and yeah, in Gandhi, although it is a different Gandhi family which ran the INC, uh, so I got that wrong in my debate, which is quite embarrassing for them. Um, but so we're thinking about things which are true there, and then we're also, so we've got a rough idea of who we're talking about now um, and where this is happening like we did not before if we just run into arguments. How long do we have? Ten minutes. We've got time. Go ahead. Um, and then, so other questions we've got to ask then is what happens when these things break up, yeah? Just in terms of countries, so do you think that Mexico would also be a good example, but especially if you do opt because it would show that you don't need courts to break them up? And yeah. this goes partly into arguments, but I just think it's in Yeah, and we'll stick Mexico in there as well. Um, definitely. Um, and we'll, we'll show all the examples you can. You're not going to come up with all the examples. So this is like quite a difficult debate, but it's ones like this where you need to be disciplined the most. Um, but then also, when we think about what's going to happen, what the consequences are, so we're saying party is going to be broken up. So party, party told to break up by court. Now, we don't actually know whether or not this is going to be successful, firstly. I mean, the, the winning line in my room was by an opposition speaker who said that, well, the ANC is just going to turn around and say, no, we refuse to be broken up, and they have a political power. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I disagree with the call. I think the government has fiat to be able to actually break up parties. Um, so it's not a line I would run. But that's the first question we've got to ask ourselves, right? And then the question is, like, what happens, right? So, um, I mean, presumably we have new parties. I want the politicians. How does the next election happen?
so we're, we're, we're trying to work out, like, are we good, just going to get, like, a, the A and C become six different parties who all agree to go into coalition with each other when they get into power, and they still have the 70% of the voters, or even more, I think, and nothing changes? Or are they going to really fight elections against each other? Um, what about politicians? How do they react? Um, how does the next election happen? Does this mean that we don't have a discussion about um, black poverty in South Africa because we're having a discussion in the election about this decision by the court, right? Um, uh, and whatever else. And then finally, we can ask a question about uh, the long term. Which is, we're asking ourselves, in the long term, are we going to get any natural change in these places? I mean, the BJP are currently in power in India. Is that a better or worse version of natural change versus this one which has been implemented by the court? So we've got all these different ideas of what's going on. And you want to always be asking, I don't think we've actually covered everything now, you're always asking yourselves, like, who, what, where, how, why, like, what's happening on the ground first. So you're getting all that done. And then you realise it's now time to make arguments, partially to the board's field. So when we're thinking about the slave, um, uh, like the, the first thing we should do is, uh, it's this house believes that we should do something, but we don't know who this house is. This house presumably is like some idea of good. So the first claim we have to make is about what the good is, right? Um, so the first claim we are making is what is good in this debate. And we've got, uh, and what decisions we make about that is going to have a huge ramification on what line we choose to run, right? Because we might say that um, we want stability. Such economic growth. We might well argue that um, poverty is the leading cause of suffering in lots of these places we're talking about, and that we should prioritise that above all other things. We might say that what is good is democracy, but then we might also define that in multiple ways, right? I mean, one sec. So we might talk about democracy as being a due process, and that being overrided. We might talk about it as aggregation of ideas. Uh, we might talk about it as check on power, right? Um, we can see, based on what's going on there, oh, something else we've got to put in, right? Um, is in this broad church, it's multi-groups. That means that like, there is like, internal got to put this earlier, like, um, discourse. So, like, the ANC or whatever doesn't stand for a, like, a set of non-changing policies, but actually has loads of different political groups and caucuses within it, who are all vying for more power, which means that the ANC changes its platform every election in a way which could, in theory, reflect the needs and wants of the people. So if you had a one-party state, for instance, but everyone was a member of that party and everyone got to play a role in what that party stood for, it would theoretically give the same outputs as a multi-party democracy. Um, yeah, you had something to do. Yeah, so I was going to ask, like, when you're talking about what is the good, um, how, how abstract or how specific do you want to go? Do you want to go, here's my knowledge I have built up, do I want to go, in this specific case I think, we think this is because, because here is a problem we've identified, or do you want to go, here is a general conception of what is the good, let's, let, let's break that abstraction down to something concrete? Mm. You don't like, want to go too general, I think. What you want to do is you want to identify some, in this, I think you want to identify either a principle or a form of suffering which is otherwise being neglected. And you want to like maybe either start or end a point by going, um, because uh, I don't think there is a distinction between practical and principal arguments, right? Because if you're making a practical argument, what you're actually doing is saying we should run the principle that a certain type of practicality, maybe like overall global happiness, should be the principle on which we run society, right? There, there's, there's no coherent distinction there. 
So you do it at some point, you need to justify the principle you're standing on, otherwise you'll get attacked on that. Right? It's one of the many things you need to protect yourself on, but you don't want to spend too long on it. So in this, if I was running a line about um, stability or economic growth, I would say, um, look, like the biggest issue facing uh, most, or like in, you know, the biggest cause of suffering in South Africa today, so there are still people who um, don't regularly have a hot meal, uh, who don't have the heat, uh, the like required like housing they should have, who live in like shanty, shanty towns, whatever else, right? And that what the South African state should do is prioritise their living standards above any like principles of democracy for the time being. And just be, say that quickly, right? You've got to be concise, always in debating. Um, but don't get something else out there, because otherwise you can stand up and go like, in prep time before. And then once you pick the, the one or the few you're picking, then it's about flow charting that out with all the other claims you need to make that work. So um, uh, check on power, you're saying that um, like ways in which you might argue that would be that um, uh, like uh, vote out of office. Um, another way you might say is that like um, like uh, ability of courts to enforce democracy. Uh, what I mean by that, so I admit it's not immediately clear, is that uh, if the internal policy changes happens within the party, members of the party don't have specific protections via constitutions, which means that if you're at the top of the party, you can just get rid or and ignore the, a groundswell of opinion within the party to replace you or reject you. You can just say no as the president and get away with that, whereas you can't do that to a parliament because... Um, parliamentarians have specific privileges in the constitution, like specific rights, which means a multi-party democracy gives you protections against the slight of dictatorial rule that, um, uh, I don't know, uh, like a, a one-party state would not, um, even if there are processes to remove that in either case. Um, what else? But anyway, you would work it out by um, like flow charting your way there. And this is the thing you're probably all more aware of and all doing okay and fine, but it's just about having that grounding first and just thinking about what's going on before you let yourself jump into it. Um, so that's pretty much it, because I think we've got to run tab. Um,